we're going to start an interview now. My name is Markus Kalinowski. I'm a new member of the ISERN, and I'm here conducting an ISERN history interview with Ross Jeffrey, one of the founding members of the ISERN. Ross Jeffrey is Professor Emeritus of Software Engineering in the School of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of New South Wales in Australia. Is there anything you would like to compliment on your current position? Yeah, thanks. Um, hi, Marcus. The only other thing is, uh, although I'm still with the University of New South Wales, uh, I spent a long time with National ICT Australia, a not-for-profit research company which we formed out of the University of New South Wales and the Australian National University. But NICTA has now uh, been absorbed into the CSIRO in Australia. That's the Commonwealth Scientific and, and Industrial Research Organization. And so I work part-time now with uh, CSIRO, only part-time. Okay. Thanks. So thank you very much. Uh, just to mention also that his research has actually directly involved over 50 government and industry organizations. And he has also co-authored several books and over 100 of relevant research papers. And so, well, thank you very much for accepting <laughs> to take part in the interview. So I'll briefly talk about the purpose and the organization of this interview before we start. The purpose of the interview is to capture the ISERN history. The idea is to capture where our community comes from, what the important findings were on an, uh, individual contributions and uh, ISERN contributions to empirical software engineering, and also the motivations for the paradigm. So therefore, in ISERN 2016 in Spain, we selected a number of ISERN people who the session participants thought are an important source of information, and you are one of them. The interview is organized in three blocks. The first block concerns the interviewee and his relation to the ISERN. The second block concerns the ISERN impact. And the third block concerns ISERN present and future. So let's start with the first block. What was your motivation to start ISERN? I think perhaps a little bit of history, first of all. Um, which is relevant to the to the whole motivation thing. Um, we started empirical research in software engineering back in the late 1970s, uh, so back around 1978, 79, and we were working then on um, programming productivity, working with a lot of um, IT organisations in Australia. So these are banks, insurance companies, motoring organisations, a whole a whole raft of of uh, companies that were building very large software, but largely in the commercial domain. So that was the kind of background for our work prior to ISERN. The other um, important point is that the uh, relationship with the University of Maryland also started in 1979 uh, when I first visited Maryland um, and gave a talk there. And so there was this relationship that was built up with, with UMD um, and at the same time, a history of working with industrial organizations, looking at software engineering issues that they had at that particular time. So that was the kind of the joint history. Maryland was working with NASA Goddard um, in a very different context to ours, but still interested in empirical work. Uh, our empirical work um, had initially had nothing to do with anyone else in the world. It was just work that we were doing that's a guy called Mike Lawrence and myself, um, largely created initially by Michael Lawrence. Um, he had, his PhD was from Berkeley um, in industrial engineering, and he had a very strong stat, stats background as well. And so he was very used to doing empirical kind of work, if, if you know what I mean. So that was, th that, was that background. Later on, um, at the university, we formed the Center for Advanced Empirical Software Research. So that wasn't wasn't created until 1995, um, the CESA. But we set up an empirical software engineering research group, the only one in Australia. There was there was virtually no other empirical work in Australia. So ISERN then became part of the, the strategy for CESA, the Centre for Advanced Empirical Software Research, uh, to create um, some legitimacy and some excitement about empirical work uh, for the research centre in Australia. It was important for that research centre to have an international position and ISERN was, was obviously going to be a vehicle uh, that could do that for CESA. 
It also meant it was for us a mechanism to improve, refine our conduct of empirical experiments. Uh, it was also a way to build a community. Uh, because we were virtually alone in Australia doing empirical work, an international community for us was absolutely essential. Um, we couldn't exist otherwise. And then on top of that, it provided the opportunity for collaboration. Um, and I'll talk a lot more about that collaboration later on, I think. But, but that collaboration was really important to us because of our isolation here. Okay. Thanks. So, um, what were the original problems that were faced during that time and which ones remain from your perspective? Yes, yeah, so I wasn't, I'm, I'm not too sure exactly what problems you meant here because I could interpret this one in two different ways. There are problems in software engineering uh, or problems in empirical software engineering. And so, for instance, in the software engineering domain, when we, as I said before, when we first started, we were looking at programming productivity. Um, and we did that for some years, working with a large number of organizations because they were concerned about their productivity. Um, but it meant that um, that became less of an issue, I guess, once, once we showed them the data and, and demonstrated that they were all the same. Uh, there was there was really very little difference in programming productivity between any of these organizations. There was one standout which we highlighted um, and we discovered the ways in which they were achieving a much better productivity than anyone else. Um, but, but that was one standout organization um, in, and it was a, um, a government quongo that just happened to be incredibly sophisticated. So there, there was those sorts of problems. We then moved on to the bigger problems that industry had, which were, which were about estimation and cost modeling. Um, so cost was always an issue in the, in the uh, commercial domain that we were working in. Less of an issue, obviously, at um, NASA Goddard. So you see, we, we then get different groups working on different problems because the industrial base that we're working with have different issues. And so we did an enormous amount of work early on in the cost estimation, uh, including building cost estimation tools for um, a couple of the large banks in Australia, uh, training um, project managers on, on cost estimation, um, sitting down with them and actually estimating their projects. We did some of that work even with a software company in Germany, um, looking at cost estimation in their organization. Uh, and then the cost modeling, of course. So this was all, even from the early 1980s, we were looking at that sort of problem. And eventually it's less and less of a problem as, as the uh, knowledge is built up. We started the whole initiative in function point counting in Australia um, very early on, before it was in use much anywhere in the world. Um, and we used to do uh, function point training courses for industry all around the country. Uh, so you, you'd have 30 or 40 uh, IT people there, again, the, in the commercial domain, learning how to count function points, how to use them. And we used to do, again, a lot of data collection in terms of function points from the companies we were working with. So, And that then created an industry, a whole uh, small group of consulting organizations that took over that role of doing function point counting, training people in it and, and using it uh, to um, better manage their projects. So they were sort of the industrial problems and you can see they're very much based in the commercial setting, commercial IT setting, not in the um, engineer, engineering setting that you might see say more in, in Europe or not in that um, NASA kind of context that you, the University of Maryland were working in. So we were all working in different problems, problem domains, but we're working with the same empirical tools and techniques. Um, so that's, that's one side of the problems. I'm, I wasn't sure whether that was the, the question you were asking or, or about uh, the empirical domain where the problems were, were about the use of experimentation. The way that, um, and it's interesting the way things change. You know, we, we started in the, as I said, in the programming space um, we then, with function points, moved to the full life cycle space, still doing work on productivity and cost modeling and so on, but across the whole life cycle. And then once uh, NICTA was created, 
the goals became completely different because in that case, uh, NICTA was all about creating value for Australia and much more focused on building new technologies, creating spin-out companies, creating um, benefit to the country. And, um, and so much less empirical work once I moved with NICTA um, because, again, the, the motivation became different. Uh, the funding body wanted something different. Um, and so, you, you know, in a sense, you kind of have to go where the funding is. And in that case, the funding was not about empirical work. So for some years, I was out of the empirical space. Uh, and only um, came to it in, in part-time, if you like. Why was the focus in the beginning on experiments? The focus in the beginning was very much being driven out of, of the University of Maryland. And there it was industry research between the software engineering lab or within the software engineering lab at the University of Maryland. So NASA Goddard, um, CSC and, and, um, and Vic's group at the university. And then, of course, Dita was working there as well um, for quite for seven years, I think it was. And as I said before, it gives a very different set of problems or issues that you try to try to work on. Given our empirical focus, um, it was just natural to do experiments and field studies. We started initially with with big field studies, collecting a lot of data from industry from the field. Um, and we used to help them with the measurement, but a lot of it came out of their own measurement systems. And so if you had 30 companies you were working with, you were dependent on them for the, for the data. We then moved more towards lab experiments, you know, true experiments, if you like, um, where I remember in one case, one of the PhD students um, unusually had a sample size of 100 um, for some inspection experiments that we were doing um, and in the in the face of in the area of software inspection laboratory experiments became much more relevant um, relevant in the sense of it was it was an appropriate research mechanism uh, irrelevant in the sense that industry in Australia wasn't interested in, in inspections um, <laughs> and so we found ourselves then in in the with a focus on proper laboratory experiments, um, but we lost our connection with industry largely um, once we were doing that, simply because in Australia, in commercial IT, uh, inspections were not very interesting um, to them. And so again, you know, the, the big focus on inspections that came out of the University of Maryland was less and less relevant for us in our context um, in terms of the industrial context, still terrific for laboratory experiments. Um, although we chose quite a different path to the rest of ICERN um, in our focus, uh, because we, we did a lot of work on developing uh, theory and publishing that theory. Uh, then we did a lot of work on experiments to explore the theory, to confirm or, or refute uh, the theory that we developed. So it was, kind of a different set of, of experiments, much less to do with techniques. So we never did any work on perspective-based reading, for example, um, because it didn't fit with our particular context. And did the, the focus on theory help you to connect with the reality of the industry? Is, is that... No, is that not no? particularly. No, not particularly. It, it was... It became very academic. Um, and which is fine, um, it just, which I think is terrific. Um, but it's much became something much, the experiments were much less about industrial impact and much more about seeking knowledge. Um, and, you know, happy to get knowledge. Don't really, don't really mind whether anyone wants to know about it or not um, in the industrial world. Uh, eventually, I'm sure it's of value. You know, if you, if you build good theory, it's, um, it means it really can be the basis for a lot of good experiments. Um, but it's, in, in software engineering, theory is pretty tough because of the complexity of the real world. Well, it's interesting, you know, that back when we published the original inspections theory paper, 
We published that in, in TSE actions. There's been some research looking at validating that theory, but not a huge amount. Part of the problem there um, with, with experiments is sample size in software engineering. That's, that's a huge problem. So we can talk about that later too. Okay. So going back to, <laughs> to the ISERN and the connection to ISERN itself, one of the questions here is why was ISERN established in this format? Yeah, I, the first thing I thought of was, was what I'd call the three C's, um, community, collaboration, and consistency. Um, it was, was very much about community um, initially. We had, we had some people around the world that were trying to do the same sort of thing. Um, so um, Koji Tori in, in Nara uh, was trying to engage with industry in their research. We'd been engaging with industry over many, many years and, and been reasonably successful on and off with that. Um, Vic, obviously, and, um, at University of Maryland had been well engaged for a long time. Um, and so that, that sense of creating this international community became, I think, the main driver that I noticed initially. Um, collaboration um, was also part of the agenda. So, um, for instance, we did a lot of collaboration with NARA. Um, we had joint projects with, with the, the Japanese. We did a lot of collaboration with Fraunhofer IESA. Um, and also with the University of Maryland. So the joint project with, with NARA, we established exchanges of staff and collaboration meetings in Japan and Australia, and it involved two different universities here in Australia. So it was Macquarie University and University of New South Wales combining with NARA. Uh, with EASA, we set up a, an enormous amount of uh, staff and student exchange programs and so we used to have um, University of Kaiserslautern students doing their project Arbeit work in Australia oh, um, and at times even their Diplom Arbeit, um, which was less less common because it's it's a more sensitive kind of um, piece of work. Uh, but it, we would exchange for six months. These were not short-term exchange. These were long-term. Uh, six months or even a year, and we sent staff, you know, professors from the University of New South Wales to Germany and to Maryland. Um, we sent research staff from the University of New South Wales to Japan to work up there, and um, we had a lot of um, s s uh, staff exchange as well as student exchange. Um, one of the exchange staff, which I find kind of interesting, one of the guys who went and worked at Fraunhofer uh, and ran the Spearman project there, um, then came back to University of New South Wales after the exchange. He then went to University of Maryland and spent six months there. Um, and he's now the CIO of Disney Parks in the US. Um, so he looks after the technology for all of their theme parks. Um, a long way from empirical software engineering research, but um, I think in I like to think in part because of the international exposure he got by working in in Germany and working in the U.S. and um, meeting his wife in the U.S. Uh, oh, nice. was was all, was all good. I think it was all good, but on a fairly light-hearted note. Uh, the third thing was consistency. The third of the C's, and the first thing we noticed uh, was, for instance, that we had amongst the initial group, a very inconsistent definition of the meaning of the word experiment. And so um, initially, I was, and some of the others were very strong that, that the word experiment had a, had a very well-defined meaning in science and that we should be using that, that controlled experiments and quasi-experiments had been defined, we knew what they meant, and that's what we should be using, those definitions. Uh, that was very different to the University of Maryland and NASA, who thought the word experiment meant you go and try something. So a slightly def different definition, a perfectly valid definition of the meaning of experiment. I do an experiment. I take a technology out and I give it a go. Uh, that's an experiment, uh, but not in the scientific sense. So we didn't even have consistency at that level. 
uh, when we first started. And I think that ISIN, a lot of ISIN was also about getting consistency in terms of what we were saying and how we were saying it. I noticed with some concern that we're still talking about the meaning of the word experiment um, uh, in the ISIN meeting last year, I think it was. Um, there was discussion about that still. Uh, so maybe it never stops. I know in the sciences they, um, they've been doing a lot of work over the last 20 years on getting better at doing experiments. Um, and I, from what I can see, the, the, um, the biological sciences certainly have gotten better than we have, um, but they've been at it for quite a bit longer. And so we've still got some work to do there in consistency. Defining taxonomies or common definitions of concepts. Yeah, yeah. The, the 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 meaning of what we're doing, being very consistent in what we say and how we say it, um, is still a challenge for us. I think. Okay, very interesting. So you yeah, you talked a little bit about some of the memories. Uh, the next question actually concerns those memories. It's what right. are the best memories? Uh, of Isern, your best, your personal best memories of Isern. So the <laughs> the best memories um, are very similar to what I was just talking about. Um, the 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 um, the collaboration. The um, I think the the staff, the student exchanges particularly. Um, so I'm still in I'm still in touch with students in Germany uh, who are no longer students. Um, and so, you know, someone like uh, Melanie Ruhr, for example, um, who is Gunther Ruhr's daughter. Okay. Um, uh, so Melanie, um, Melanie did her diplom, project Arbeit, diplom Arbeit, um, and spent quite some time here in Australia. Oh, nice. And, you know, we've remained very good friends, um, uh, my wife and myself with Melanie and her husband and uh, her children now and yeah that's that's sort of I guess some of the fondest memories the best memories I think also the great memories in terms of um, the advancement in empirical software engineering the way in which I think the ISERN community really has made a difference in software engineering in general uh, being able to influence um, the work in software engineering to recognize that empirical software engineering is a really, really important part of it across the board. You, you don't have to be part of ISIN or part of the empirical community to be using empirical techniques, but the way in which ISIN has been able to lift the visibility of that is one of, I think, one of the best memories. Okay, so thank you very much. This is actually the okay. end of the first block. Let's start the second block of our interview. This block concerns the ISERN impact. And the first question I have to you uh, concerning the ISERN impact is, what is the impact of ISERN on software engineering research and industrial practice? Okay, thanks, Marcos. Um, maybe I'll tackle this from a general and then a specific kind of viewpoint. So there's really four areas, the software engineering research, general and specific, and the industrial practice, general and specific. Um, First of all, on the software engineering uh, research, I think that uh, ISERN has had a huge direct impact um, through the creation of the annual conference um, on, on empirical software engineering and measurement, um, the journal, the empirical journal, and, and also um, through the content we see in information and software technology journal. So that, that's, a, I think, an enormous initial impact. When we first started, uh, we didn't have the ESAM. Um, then, we, then we had the annual metrics conference as well as the ESAM conference, and eventually we were able to merge those together. Uh, so metrics and ESAM, uh, although ESAM it took on a new name after the merger. Uh, so that we could include the, the measurement aspects out of metrics. So that's that's a, a really huge direct impact on research. The indirect impact, um, I think, has been in the international recognition of empirical software engineering and the use of empiricism in general in software engineering. So there was that survey conducted at ICSI, probably, I'm not sure when it was now, four or five years ago, where they asked everyone attending to indicate the area they areas they worked in 
And um, one of those areas was empirical software engineering. And it turned out that it was the most ticked area of any area in software engineering. You know, people tick testing and empirical software engineering, or they, they tick, you know, cost estimation and empirical software engineering, but empirical was the most common. That's, that's an enormous impact over a very short period of time. In terms of industry, um, in Australia, I can, I can only talk about Australia. In Australia, I don't see any uh, significant impact in general. I don't think ISERN has, uh, has had a significant impact. Even though we've had ISERN meetings in Australia uh, over the years, um, we haven't uh, been able to get significant industrial interest. Um, we don't see much industrial interest at, at ICSI anymore either. Uh, so this, this is not unusual. Um, in terms of um, specific, however, we've had impact in, in, in individual organisations uh, through research projects that we've carried out. But these are not really ISERN projects. Um, most of the industry impact is occurs through some kind of technologies. And um, if, if we we're trying to look, ISERN doesn't usually provide a whole lot of technologies. Uh, it's, it's not what it's about. And, uh, and so therefore, you know, even if we look at inspections, as I mentioned before, it, it's not a big deal in Australia. Um, and so all of the research done in ISERN over the years on inspections is not seen as particularly relevant to industry here in Australia, for whatever reason. Um, so yes, we've had lots of specific influence of ISERN, you know, things like my being able to supervise Adam Trendovitz at uh, Kaiserslautern wouldn't have happened without ISERN. Um, the work that we were doing in proof engineering um, with with the formal proof people uh, and the um, and the uh, Linux microkernel, uh, there's no way we would have been able to to be recognised as relevant if it weren't for things like ISERN and the journals and and so on. Um, I guess that's you know that's probably all I could say in that area. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is: What were the three biggest ISERN successes and failures? From your point of view. Okay. Okay. The su the successes then are um, I think the publication venues, uh, huge success, the conference, the journals, and so on. Um, the creation of the global empirical community, um, and and the commitment of that group to shared research, uh, I think, is a huge success. Um, the whole, in a more general sense, the culture and the intellectual heritage that comes with an organization like ISERN, uh, I think is, is incredibly important, that, that intellectual heritage that you don't get unless you've got organizations that can uh, foster it and encourage it. Um, and then, of course, the collaboration between members of ISERN. Uh, again, it's just not, it's not gonna happen uh, unless there's something driving it. Um, and I think ISERN's been really successful in those, those four areas. Uh, in terms of failures, wow, um, I think we've been unable to scale up our international research collaboration to, to the degree that would achieve uh, immutable outcomes in theory. Uh, we just haven't done that. Um, is it expecting too much? Probably, uh, <laughs> but but we certainly haven't been able to do it. We, we, you know, we've got lots of good research, but lots of good questions still. Um, it also seems to me that we're struggling to keep up with technology change. Um, so um, I don't see ISERN very active in, in hot topics, if you like. Uh, cybersecurity uh, is everywhere. Everyone's doing cybersecurity. Uh, I don't know that ISERN's doing much. Um, I might be wrong. Um, other technologies we're, we're working with at the moment, smart contracts, um, uh, Ethereum, um, the use of Ethereum and, and virtual, virtual um, monetary systems. Um, you know, these are technologies that are incredibly important at the moment, but I'm not sure ISERN is keeping up um, with that. So although we've provided lots of evidence in other areas, um, we haven't even nailed the theories in that space. 
and we may be falling behind. Um, so it depends, you know, failures depends on the goals. Um, if, if our goal was to influence research, then I think we've been incredibly successful. If our goal was to influence industry, then less successful. The next question concerns your career. What was the impact on your career, institution, and environment of being part of ISON, of having founded and being part of ISON? Okay. Um, it's been critical. Um, so, you know, my career in empirical software engineering, as I said, started in 1978 or something like that. Um, and the, um, the identification and availability of mentors Uh, for young researchers is, I, I believe, unbelievably important. <laughs> um, and so having the right mentors and the, the right examples in place and then having visibility and access um, is really important to young researchers. And ICERN certainly was, was one of the things that provided that availability to lots of researchers at the University of New South Wales, including myself. Um, so we, um, it was also important in the establishment of the center that I had at the university, the Center for Advanced Empirical Software Research, uh, CESA. Uh, so CESA existed from 1995 to 2002. Um, and ISON was part of the recipe for the establishment of that. It was part of the legitimacy of that independent research center. Um, in the university sector because it established the work we were doing in the international setting. And the university doesn't fund a research center unless it's internationally recognized. And ISERN was part of that. So, yes, an, an enormous impact on my career, also on what was done at the University of New South Wales, and then, then what was available to all the students. And the final question, which might be the most complicated one of this vlog, is what are your main one to three contributions to empirical soft engineering in connection to ISO? Okay, um, so you could interpret this in lots of different ways, but I think um, for me, uh, you know, it's very personal. What are your main contributions? Um, I, th I, th I think uh, on, the, on the one hand, my representation of the empirical community in, in ICSI, um, And TSE uh, was, I hope, was significant in being a, a PC member of ICSI for many, many, many years, um, uh, being program co-chair for, for ICSI, um, being a TSE editor for, again, many years, um, too many years. Um, I think that's, I, I hope I made a contribution to software engineering in general by representing the empirical community in, in the broader software engineering community. Those, those roles that I filled there were only possible because of the, the international community contacts provided through ISERN. Um, so ISERN was important in providing to me the ability to serve uh, in, in um, the IEEE setting and the ACM setting. Um, I think we also made a contribution by hosting two ISERN meetings in Australia um, back back in the old days. Um, so when we did one here in Sydney and then we did one at Noosa, um, I, th I think that was a contribution. Um, and no, I, I guess that's that's about you know that's that's probably enough. Um, that's two contributions I've identified. Okay, thanks. Uh, just to complement this this question. These two contributions are more uh, contributions in the, in, the, in the aspect of influence, uh, of the influence of empirical soft engineering for the broader yeah. soft engineering area. Are there yeah. uh, any specific um, research contributions that you would like to highlight during those years? Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, I, you know, we, we did have lots of impact in industry in Australia through the research projects. Um, so a, a good example would be um, for many years we worked with a, a small uh, software organization here in Australia um, and uh, we built for them a software cost estimation tool which we empirically uh, showed to them 
was way more accurate than any of the estimates they'd been carrying out previously without the tool. Um, we, we built the tool, we, in, we employed it in their organization, was available to them and, and you know, it meant they were able to do much better at their cost estimation. Interestingly though, they then stopped using it. What they did was they took all of the knowledge, all of the rules out of the tool, wrote them down on pieces of paper and did it that way. Okay. Uh, <laughs> they said that, that in the end they told us, uh, and I'll quote here, the tool is too German. <laughs> okay. um, they thought they thought the tool was was just way too precise and and way too demanding on them. They wanted something very very easy and simple. So they all of the um, cost drivers we'd identified for their organisation, they took them all took them all and used them all, but used them in a much more much less formal way. Um, so that was a, a cultural thing going on there that probably we're not too good at, at uh, identifying. We like building tools. Um, so yeah, we, we have had industrial um, um, uh, contributions, certainly. We, as I said, we used to do, I used to do a lot of um, um, estimation training for one of the, one of the large Australian banks. Um, we, we taught everyone in Australia how to count function points. <laughs> Yeah, lots, lots of, lots of contributions in that sort of sense, uh, largely in the industrial setting, I guess. There's another um, uh, area of of contribution that that I felt has been important over the years, and that's that's in this whole area of theory, the the presence or absence of theory, and um, perhaps if if you were to to look at uh, the Paths to Software Engineering Evidence paper that was published. Um, in there, there's a, a figure in which I, I try to show the, the place of empirical software engineering um, depending on, dependent on the preconditions that exist within the, the setting in which you're working. Uh, so it may be, for example, I, I give one path there which says, Empirical software engineering is not particularly relevant at all. It's it's a new technology you, in software engineering. You just want to go ahead and do it in an industrial setting. You just do it. It's it it doesn't need any empirical work before you do it. You just want to go and try it. Um, however, on the other hand, if you do satisfy a whole set of preconditions in in the industrial setting, if there's a theory, you go down one path, which is setting of hypotheses conducting experiments either in the laboratory or in the industry or doing simulation. All of those are possible where you do have some theory. Or if you don't have theory, then the path there is all about technical evaluation, or possibly um, that technical evaluation could result in some post hoc theory. It's possible you might derive some theory from that technical evaluation, although typically we're not very good at that. Uh, or the other path there is you just go and do case studies and field research. And so it's a different kind of empiricism where you don't have theory, but you're trying to understand what's going on. Um, case studies, field research, excellent for that. Where you have theory, experiments. Formal experiments are, are the best way of exploring that. So maybe if, if that could be considered a contribution in the research domain is over the years, uh, a number of papers about theory in software engineering and the use of em the place of empiricism in developing theory or making use of theory. Um, perhaps, perhaps that's one area in which I've been able to make a contribution a little different to others. I don't think I'm one to judge my uh, research contributions. You know, that's for others to judge. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so, okay, with this, we are going to close the second block. This last block of the interview concerns Eisern present and future. Do you think your first idea or vision of Eisern is still in the community? Um, okay, um, thanks, Marius. Um, when I looked at this question, I I thought I'm I'm not sure that it's um, that it's very consistent at the moment. Um, because there were a number of aspects to the vision, um, I decided that I'd, I'd, I'd go back and have a look at what that vision might have been initially, um, because everyone has different perspectives on that. And um, the initial ISO vision, I think, was very Maryland-based. 
um, and derive from that SEL experience. And so when I went back and had a look, the, the quote actually says uh, that software engineering research needs to be performed in an experimental context uh, that allows us to observe and experiment with the technologies in use, understand their weaknesses and strengths, tailor the technologies for the goals and characteristics of particular projects and package them together with empirically gained experience, blah, 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 blah. That's, that's interesting because it uses the word experiment in a non-scientific sense. Um, it very much says you look at a technology in use in an organization um, and you try to play around with it, I guess, uh, and, and see if you can make things better. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I think that's only one view of what ICERN might do. I think uh, ICERN's moved away from that in lots of research, um, where, where we're much, uh, in ca some cases, just trying to understand a technology or trying to understand uh, a particular process. Or we may just be uh, trying to better model processes in industry um, rather than follow that initial view of, of software engineering research being empirically based. Um, in, a, in a sense, empiricism might uh, filter through to all software engineering research when it's relevant. Um, but ICERN might do things other than, other than that initial, uh, initial vision. Because that initial vision has some significant implications. Uh, it implies that you, um, you have some industrial funding and commitment. Um, and that's not that easy to get at times. It also implies that um, there's a focus on industrial issues um, rather than knowledge issues. It implies that you have some sort of ability to provide timely solutions to those issues. The one thing you learn very quickly working with industry is that they want the answer quickly um, and they want it cheap and <laughs> usually. And if you can't provide that, well, too bad. They're not going to work with you. It also implies that what you're doing with that industry partner will be suitable for research publication in top tier journals or top tier, top tier venues because that's the requirement that we have as academics. And yet quite often you're working with industrial issues that, that are going to be very difficult to publish in top tier venues. And, and so there's, there's some significant implications in there and I think that's partly why we see different kinds of things happening in ICERN now uh, in addition to that original, um, that original uh, idea. Quite often industries um, can do empirical work without us. Um, they're quite capable of collecting some data. Uh, at times they're also quite happy just working with anecdotal information. They're not, they're not that keen for, for really solid substantial empirical studies if that's going to take too long or cost too much or not come up with the solution that they want. So quite often they'll take other paths and, and that means that the academic pursuing that original vision has to have a fairly good consulting head on his shoulders um, because it's very much a consulting kind of job that's going on uh, with that initial vision. And you know, not all academics are good at consulting. That's, that's you know, patently clear. Um, so at the moment then, perhaps in terms of um, the vision for ICERN, um, there's opportunities to look at particular technologies perhaps um, and create a, a, a collaboration around particular technologies. Um, but that will need some leadership, some opportunity creation, some understanding of the balance between empiricism and the technologies that, that we're looking at through that empiricism. So that's, that's, not so, that's not so easy. And then in terms of collaboration, you add the problem that industrial domains across countries are quite likely to be quite different. Yes. And so the issues are, uh, can be quite different. And what makes a, a fantastic experiment in one lab may, may be quite irrelevant in another lab in a different industrial setting.
Um, and so, you know, it's initially we had this very focused ICERN objective around industrial partnership. Um, that's not possible for everyone, and and so we may uh, we may need to to try and work on that vision to to categorize it under a few different categories. The initial the initial vision and maybe some other visions uh, that can be uh, well served by the collaborative opportunities of ISEN. The next question concerns uh, something that you have already mentioned before, which is uh, that empirical soft engineering is already uh, part uh, of other conferences and it's being considered in other conferences. Given this new reality, what is the role of ISERN? For me, it's all about community. Um, there, there, a researcher has to be part of a community and ICERN is an excellent community. Um, if you look at a recent quote uh, from the Vice Chancellor of Cambridge University, uh, who's, who's just about to retire from that position, be replaced, um, but he was talking in a recent talk about um, the global community and um, the fact that, it, in his view, it was essential for universities to collaborate globally and to be part of that global community in research. And um, he's not coming from software engineering or empirical software engineering or anything close to it. Um, but he was emphasizing the need for Cambridge, in this case, to be part of that global research community. And I think the same thing applies to, to us as individuals. Um, we have to be part of a global community. We have to, uh, we have, to have trust. Uh, and, and trust is developed through face-to-face -face meetings and trust is, is developed by getting to know, know the individuals and um, that's what ISEN provides. It provides the opportunity for that community to come together and to build trust and then to collaborate. Um, perhaps we, um, as I said, we might need a, a bit of work on the vision side um, to make it a little more effective, uh, but that's, you know, that can be done. So it might be also related with uh, the idea of collaborating uh, cross-country and uh, replicating studies, improving external validity or trying to reach yeah. Uh, yeah. relevant goals from a general, more general perspective and yes? Yeah, uh, yeah. and it, a lot of it's also, you know, I mentioned that um, in software engineering quite often there's a problem with, um, with the um, number of subjects, uh, the sample size and You know, historically, we've seen very little emphasis on sample size, and we've seen a lot of experiments with very small sample sizes. And yet, uh, when we did some work on um, on uh, inspections, for example, um, so we reanalyzed the AT and T inspection data. Um, Larry Votter um, made it available to us, and from memory, what we what we found in the AT and T inspection data was that Practically all of the de defects were identified, I think, by two or three people in the organization. Um, they had some really good inspectors, but only a couple of them. Um, when we did experiments in uh, graduate classes at the University of New South Wales, inspection experiments there, again, we found a very small number of people who could identify defects really easily and a very large number of people who couldn't identify defects to save themselves. They just weren't any good at it for some reason. Now, we never did any uh, experiments to find out why they couldn't do it. We just observed that, that the vast majority of people were not good at identifying defects, even in design documents, um, let alone code. And um, so that means that the variance, the individual variance, is incredibly high going to be very, very high um, because you get real experts and real novices and they're always, they all have the same experience in, in industry, but some of them just can't do it. When you take that huge variance, the implications for sample size becomes really important. But getting sample size, ISOM could help um, because you're moving across countries, you've got lots of different labs, it's possible to do the same experiment across across these different environments, but again, it will introduce other variables um, when you do that. <laughs> and so sample size goes up again um, if we're going to get significant results. Um, so yeah, 
opportunity and cost, I think, in, in, in that collaboration. But certainly being part of the global community, I think, in, in 2017 is, is, is terribly important, more important now than it's ever been. And what would you change from current ISO? And if you could change something, what would you change? Okay. Um, I mentioned before the need, I think, to focus on a small number of particular technologies. Um, that means providing the opportunity to identify those technologies. As, as you mentioned, there's some um, emphasis on requirements engineering now. And so over the last few years, there's been the, the session on requirements. Um, and in a sense, that's focusing on a particular technology or a particular area of concern. Um, I think that's, that's going to be important uh, for collaboration. It, it, it was for many years that the focus was on inspections. That's, in the end, I don't think proved a great deal. Um, it was somewhat disappointing because of the conflicting results. Uh, that came out of that you know, from different ex the same experiment in different settings um, and so you know we need to I think we need to focus on particular technologies perhaps we should focus more on staff and student exchange uh, in my experience that was that was really important but again funding is critical there so with the uh, with the Fraunhofer exchange when a German student came to Australia, we paid them their living allowance for the six months of their visit. Uh, Fraunhofer paid their travel expenses uh, and vice versa. When we sent people to Germany, we paid their travel, Fraunhofer paid their living expenses. But you've got to have the funds to do that. Um, you, um, I, perhaps we need some focus also on um, collaborative research funding opportunities. Um, most, I don't know a lot about other countries, but, but countries do provide funding for international collaboration. Quite often, in Australia, quite often you'll get a call for collaboration with a particular country. Some politician decides it's really important that we collaborate with Vietnam this year. Um, and so here's a whole lot of money, go do it. And you need to identify those, get them to ISERN quickly, and work out how it can be how it can be used. Otherwise, it it will go to astronomy, um, and they'll discover another planet um, rather than improve empirical software engineering. So, um, and as I said, um, I spend a lot of time in in ISERN working on trust um, between members. Um, there's lots of ways you can do that, I guess. So that's, that's, that's the way I'd be trying to focus the future. Okay, the next question is very closely related to this one. If you could go back on time, what would you change if you could change something in the past? Wow. Um, the, only, the only thing I, I would insert would be a, 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 a more focus on vision and strategy. I, I have a feeling that um, the ISEN meetings, you know, I don't go to every ISEN meeting, but I've been to a lot of them. Um, and I don't see a lot of focus on vision and strategy um, for ISEN. And I, I think that's to be continually successful over a long period of time. I think you've got to get, you've got to get that out in the open and you've got to get some agreement on vision and strategy and some agreement. It, it won't be across the board, but um, it existed when it was first created. Um, it's it's d diffuse now, I think, is, is probably a fair word for vision and strategy. If your vision is simply collaboration, uh, then it's very opportunistic. Um, if you dig deeper into collaboration and you start to focus on particular technologies and particular outcomes you'd like to achieve, then you're starting to get a vision then you're able to build a strategy of how to achieve that uh, through funding, through whatever means you might have again. But certainly, you know, when we first created ISEN, there was no charge for ISEN meetings. They were free. Uh, so when we ran the first ISEN meeting in Australia, it didn't cost any anyone. I mean, they had to pay their airfare to get there and accommodation, I guess. Uh, but the meeting itself didn't cost um, because we had 
we had a strategy to fund it. At the moment, we don't have a strategy to fund these meetings. Um, so it costs people a little bit more. That's okay. I'm, I'm not saying it should be the other way around. I'm just saying more focus on strategy, I think, would help. Okay, thank you. Okay. And the last question, uh, where do you see the ISERN in the future? Okay, I, 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 I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I think it will be successful. Um, it, has to, um, it has to continually look at justifying this focus on empirical work. Um, I don't think there'll be any problem doing that. Um, but I think it does need to continually look at the need for empirical knowledge in the software engineering community. In, in software engineering, unfortunately, students do not uh, generally receive any education on the history and philosophy of science. They generally do not receive any education on data analysis, statistics, um, the sort of techniques they need to, knowledge they need to have to do empirical work. Um, maybe we could change that. Um, I, I did teach a history and philosophy of science course at one stage, and students love it. It's, it's good fun. Um, in a graduate class, it's great fun. In an undergraduate class, I, I probably <laughs> wouldn't be so keen. Um, but certainly, um, I said may be able to do something about ed the education area um, moving forward, which it, uh, it, it did a little bit. So, uh, so there was there have been some courses created in that area, but I don't think we've been very successful there. So maybe ISON could move a bit in that direction in the future into the education space. Um, maybe um, you know they could refine the, the the notions of collaboration, and and that'll make it even more successful. So when you're talking about the philosophy of science, do you think? that we should focus more also on the theory and, and the knowledge and presenting the, it, evolving it, or is that also part of it? And I, besides yeah, the education I think, part? I think people, yeah, I think people, if you're going to do empirical software engineering, you really need to understand um, scientific method. And um, students typically don't understand the scientific method. Uh, they're not taught that, uh, certainly not in an engineering degree. Um, Maybe, maybe, maybe if they were doing a science degree, they would have a chance to look at it. I don't know, um, but it's it's just a fascinating area. At any rate, it's just it's a great fun, it's a fun kind of area to explore, um, and it never stops, um, you know, developing. So it's part history, part current, um, and until we, you know, it's it's interesting. There's um, to see us still recognizing in software engineering that people don't understand what a, what a true experiment is um, means we've still got a long way to go. Yes. So, thank you very much for the interview.